beginning, there are trees. From trees, paper is made, and paper makes possible tomorrow's newspaper. To ensure a perpetual supply of choice culture, tracts of timberland have been acquired at Heron Bay on the shore of Lake Superior, on Manitoulin Island, both in the province of Ontario, and at Bay Como, Franklin, and Shelter Bay on the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the province of Quebec. Let us journey 1,230 air miles to the first of the communities to be built by the Quebec North Shore Paper Company, Shelter Bay on the fringe of the Great North Woods. 300 miles northeast of Quebec City and with miles of virgin forest in its backyard that extend northward into the hinterland, Shelter Bay is a thriving town of busy, healthy, happy people. Although on the edge of the wilderness, still Shelter Bay has many big city conveniences such as plenty of pure water, central heat, an efficient sewer system, telephone and electric lights. There is no paper mill here, but from Shelter Bay are shipped each year thousands of cords of wood to the Ontario Paper Company mill. There is a church, a school, a well-equipped hospital, and of course the ever-present movie theater. In the far background, to the right of this comfortable house, can be seen a dam outside of Shelter Bay, built by the Quebec North Shore Paper Company on Rocky River. Attention is called to it because it will be obvious as the story of paper is told how important a part water plays in the operation from the woods to the present. Another establishment is Franklin, 90 miles southwest of Shelter Bay, strategically located on the Franklin River. 10 miles to the south, near Bay Como, water is harnessed in this pipe of wooden stage. 17 and a half feet in diameter, it is more than a mile long, and 200 feet of water pressure drives the generator in the modern electric power plant to supply both the paper mill and the town itself. Oh, site of the Quebec North Shore Paper Company new sprint mill on the north shore of the St. Lawrence lies near the mouths of the Utard and Manicouagan rivers both of which flow southward through the forest to the Gulf. Bay Como's population of more than 3,400 is rightfully proud of the bustling town with its wide paved streets and excellent stores. Here are no log cabins, but in their place are attractive homes that offer all the amenities of city life. Many of the town's activities are centered in the handsome community buildings. Everywhere there are impressive signs of planning for the future, as in this large and well-equipped school. In all these towns, there are adequate facilities for satisfying the spiritual, educational, and medical needs of the people. Although it was founded as recently as 1936, already it is a thriving industrial center concentrated about the fine power plant and paper mill. Such useful arts as weaving at a hand loom are practiced in these placid homes taking no account of the rugged country that lies outside the door. Operations in the timberland are continuous throughout the year, but the cycle may be said to begin in the fall when shiploads of supplies are sent down the broad St. Lawrence from Montreal to discharge their cargoes of meat, flour, potatoes, and a variety of other stores in the company establishment located on tidewater of the North Shore. Much of the supplies are for the support of the town, but many tons must be carried inland for distribution among the lumber camps where appetites are always hot. Foodstuffs for men and horses and other supplies are piled up temporarily in caches on the shores of rivers and lakes. From these depots, they will be taken into the bush. Moving always north by landing barge and by truck, we are now nearing one of the great timber stands of the Quebec North Shore Paper Company three of which stretch northward from the St. Lawrence.
The fourth area utilized by the Ontario Paper Company is the one at Heron Bay on Lake Superior. The fifth, recently acquired, is the area on Manitoulin Island. Long before supplies are moved into the interior, aerial surveys are made to determine the area to cut. Where it is still necessary for the foresters to examine the timberland on foot, their work is lightened by the cameraman, who looks down on the forest in comfort, surveying thousands of acres at a glance. Wearing an oxygen mask, for he is flying in rarefied air at a height of 18,000 feet, he photographs the landscape more than three miles beneath with a mapping camera. Back at headquarters, the forestry engineer studies the aerial photograph and pieces them together to form an accurate map of the country's timber. Thus, by the use of modern aerial survey, the cutting operations can be scientifically planned for years ahead. So far, no attempt has been made to fly the logs down from the woods, and hacking out a highway through the wilderness is still an important operation. Fortunately, the men in the bush have the best of road building equipment to clear away the brush, cut a path through solid rock, and build up the shoulders for the heavy loads. Now let us return to the supplies that were accumulated at the caches and must be moved upstream by landing barges to the various camps from which the lumberjacks operate. Over rough terrain, strong and willing horses are also used to get the food to the camp. Still another transportation problem arises each fall, for now the men who work in the woods must be taken to the trees. They go by land, by water, and by air. lumberjacks of only a few years ago would have contemplated the spectacle of loggers flying to the bases by airplane and then making the trip to camp by taxi cab. And they would have been just as astonished at the antics of the lively jeep that dashes about delivering men and mail, policing the telephone systems, and covering country that until recently only the plodding horse could negotiate. Here at last, we're in one of the camps but no longer is it an isolated outpost. Instead, it is in constant two-way communication by radio as well as by telephone with the outside world. It's a brisk fall day, and close at hand are the big trees. The first operation in felling is to clear away the brush at the foot of the trees to be cut. The lumberjack notches the tree with his keen axe on the side toward which he wishes it to fall. Only a small notch is needed, which means the saving of wood. He tests the accuracy of his work, for the axe handle points in the direction in which the tree will topple. Next, he makes a deep saw cut on the opposite side. It's a swift operation. In fact, a skilled worker can fell and cut up as much as three cords of pulpwood in a day. There is the familiar cry of the wood. Timber! The branches and slash are trimmed off and later are filed away from the road. This is an unwritten law of the woods. The utmost care is taken to protect this slash from the red monster fire. Road barriers are an insistent reminder of the rule against smoking because the criminal hand of the flames is an ever-present menace, the ruthless destroyer of the forests. He measures four feet with his saw and cuts the tree into length. The logs are neatly stacked for scaling to be left in the woods until they are hauled to the nearest water. They must be securely piled, or it won't be long before howling blasts will bring down the heavy snows. The logs are carefully examined by a checker and scaler 
and stamped with an identifying mark to indicate the logs have been measured. From this measurement or scale, the men are paid and the company can compile its inventory of pulpwood cut. Rigid cutting rules prescribe that trees may not be cut more than 18 inches above the ground and until the trees have reached its full growth of 80 to 100 years. Although millions of trees are cut each fall and winter, no more are felled in any area than nature will replace. There always will be trees because the little fellows are carefully protected to ensure ample regrowth. Farther up the mountain, where already some light snow has fallen, we see another method of cutting with mechanical saws. They are less picturesque than the axe, but they get their trees. As the winter draws in, the days get shorter, so the work must move along briskly. Here the logs are snaked out of the woods by a power-operated cable from a logging donkey. Still another unit in the new and modern equipment is this powerful tractor that hauls a heavy load of logs to the nearby sawmill where they are cut into lumber. Large logs supply the lumber required by the community and by new construction. The smaller trees are cut to four foot lengths and discharged into the water. Winter comes first in the mountains. Here in Shelter Bay, it is still autumn, and the triangular navigation marker still guides the shipping. But one day, the winds come roaring down from the north, and the long, white winter has begun. The triangular channel marker means nothing now until spring. It's bitter cold, and the snow piles high, but life goes on at Shelter Bay and the other company establishments, for the giant plows break roads to church and school and store. Nor is it much different up in the bush. Plunging out of the woods comes a snowmobile, typical of the modern mechanized equipment that has eased the grim hardships which once prevailed in this stern and unrelenting country. Time was when the area was cut off by impassable drifts. But now, Airplanes equipped with skis land on fields that have been rolled by tractors or on the icy surface of rivers and lakes. Even airplanes and other machines have not entirely outmoded the familiar dog team, still used by the forester for winter transportation when more timberland is being examined for future development. Of course, still another method of getting about is the primitive practice of putting one foot ahead of the other when both of them are wearing snowshoes. That's the way a cruising team moves through the winter woods. The men in an exploration crew measure trees with calipers and calculate the number of cords that any given area will produce. This is entirely a local operation. The team strikes out from a camp and pitches a tent for shelter in case they should be trapped by blizzards and cannot return to camp before night falls. The cutting operation is unchanged in the winter season. The tree is notched, and then that sharp saw bites deep into the pulpwood. With their appetites as keen as the blade of the axe, the lumberjacks head back to camp at day's end. Awaiting them are heated bunkhouses, hot water, and the ever-welcome entertainment of the radio. Most important is the food. No music is sweeter than that the cook plays to announce rhythmically, come and get it. The pulpwood is brought down from the timberland in many ways. Most elemental is the timber chute, sometimes half a mile high. The logs crash and spin through the air, piling up on the ice of a frozen stream as much as 10,000 cores. On most jobs, the logs are hauled out on horse-drawn sleds and unloaded on the ice. Here on a frozen lake are piles of logs that have been unloaded from horse-drawn sleds. Elsewhere, trucks and tractors are used to pull the heavily laden sleds of logs to the ice.
Here the logs are unloaded onto a conveyor that is powered by one of those versatile jeeps. Day in and day out, the pulpwood accumulates until on the icy surface of rivers and lakes throughout the area, there are piles, some containing 15 to 20,000 cords. Winter is long in the North Woods, but always in the eternal cycle of the season, spring is not too far away. Come the longer and warmer days, winter's grip on the streams is relaxed. Once again, the waterways are open to traffic and life in the woods takes on a quickened tempo. Now the rivers leap and roar and the great harvest of logs cut through the cold months and piled on the ice is released to start its journey southward. are sluiced down the steep mountainsides, while others have been pushed off the banks or have floated away when the ice melted. Log jams are often broken by men in small boats. However, with logs cut into four-foot length, which is the practice nowadays, jams are few. When they do occur, a few sticks of dynamite loosens up the mass so it moves again. what you might call a man-made jam. A boom is stretched as a barrier to hold back the log. When the loading plants downstream need more pulpwood for shipment to the paper mills, word is telephoned miles to the north and the required amount is sent on its way. Through the spring drive, wide rivers of logs are backed up. How many have been cut? Well, the best estimate is 38 million sticks of four foot each. One thing is sure. The supply of logs is not too great, for the mills are grinding away 24 hours a day, six days a week, all year round. Ingenious engineers have devised several ways for bringing the logs to the plants. Here at Bay Como, they are carried for miles by gravity flow of water in this dramatic flume that connects with the two nearby rivers. At Shelter Bay, when their long voyage through the turbulent rapids is completed, they go up a conveyor that carries them to the barking trough. Rotation of the huge steel cylinders tosses them against one another, and by friction, the bark is removed. With their bark rubbed off, the logs, slick and shining, tumble out for another ride, in this case, up a jack ladder that moves them to the dock, where they are delivered by chutes into the hold of a waiting vessel, which will carry them up the St. Lawrence and across Lake Ontario to the Thurles Mill. When there is no cargo carrier tied up at the dock, the logs are flumed to stockpiles. Still another method is used here in Franklin, where a flume runs right down Main Street, floating the pulpwood to a waiting ship. Here the operation is somewhat more direct for the logs go bobbing along by water all the way with no help from the conveyors and are sluiced straight into the hole. Once the logs are stacked aboard ship, the company pulpwood boat is ready to proceed up the St. Lawrence and across Lake Ontario to the paper mill at Thurl. All summer through the navigation season, the ships ply the St. Lawrence River and Lake Ontario to the Ontario Paper Company mill on the Welland Ship Canal, a famous waterway that connects Lake Ontario with Lake Erie bypassing the Niagara River and the Falls. From the timberlands, a week away by water, come thousands of cords of pulpwood each year to be converted into newsprint paper. From the ship's dock near the mill, the logs are unloaded by cranes and come tumbling out in a crashing thunder of sound. They have one of two destinations. Some of them are carried directly to the mill, where they will be processed immediately. Still others, 
climb up an endless chain to the summit of a towering pile of logs, a mountain of wood containing as much as 30,000 cords. Such vast reserve stocks are needed because new spring consumption from Canadian mills alone is some 90,000 tons per week. This ingenious device, appropriately called the orange peel grab, handles the logs with speed and with safety to the workers. It bites into the stockpile, closes its huge jaws, and swings around with a mouthful of logs that are dropped on the conveyor. Hour after hour and day after day, there is this unhurried march of pulpwood to the paper mill. The first step is a washing operation in which the peeled logs are tossed about in rotating drums and cleansed with streams of cold water. Then they are discharged into another conveyor. Although to the unskilled eye, the logs all look pretty much alike, the experts who work at the sorting tables unerringly separate those best adapted for mechanical from those that go to chemical processing. Farther up the moving tables, another sharp-eyed inspector pulls logs off the line because they are defective. Knots and other flowers are removed with this machine, developed by company engineers and amusingly named the woodpecker. New sprint consists of approximately 15% chemical pulp and 85% mechanical. The latter gives paper the characteristics that enable it to absorb ink on high-speed presses. Chemical pulp gives it strength and flexibility. The logs that have been selected for the chemical process are delivered a shoving, jostling mass to the chipper. They are cut up into chips that are shaken about on screens. Only the smaller chips pass through the mesh. The larger pieces are sent back for further reduction. When they are the right size, the chips flow like a river of wood up a conveyor to another building. In the towers are the digesters, where the chips are mixed with chemicals in the sulfite process. Complete scientific control of the chips and the chemicals is maintained at every step of the operation. A byproduct of this process is the manufacture of alcohol, of which are produced nearly a million gallons annually from sulfite liquid formerly wasted. Now we return to the logs that were chosen on the sorting tables for mechanical processing in this battery of grinders. Each one of them can transform 30 cords of wood into high-grade pulp every 24 hours. The logs are forced under pressure against huge grindstones. Water flows over them continuously, mixing with the fibers of the wood. From the bottom of the grinder issues a steady stream of pulp. At frequent intervals, samples are taken for analysis in the mill laboratory as a check on quality. Throughout the mill, in every department, and in every operation, there are constant tests to ensure the highest standards and minimum deviation. Mechanical and sulfite pulps are thoroughly beaten together. After chemicals have been added to color and brighten the paper, the mixture is pumped into the paper-making machine. It flows onto wire screens, much of the water is drained off, and the motion of the screen causes the pulp fibers to interlace and become paper. Next, the wet web of fibers races through a series of rolls to squeeze out more of the water content. Here it passes between still other rollers. At this point, it is still two-thirds water. Finally, it is further dried by moving around heated cylinders to evaporate the remaining moisture. Now it has the crispness of paper. A last touch is given by steel calendar rollers that polish the paper and give it a smooth finish. This is the culmination of the efforts of 10,000 men, men in the woods, the towns and the mills. Here paper, fine paper, has been made from trees. After it has been rewound on steel spindles, it goes to another department where it is prepared for shipment by wrapping in extra heavy paper. Then the rolls of paper, which weigh about a ton each, are trundled along on a conveyor to the dock. Company-owned ships are waiting to transport them in order that trees may finally become newspapers. The rolls fill the holes and then are loaded also on the decks of sturdy freighters that will plow across three of the Great Lakes to their destination. So closes the story 
of trees to new spread. The product of a great and effective combination of Canada's forests and rivers, of its mills and its people. This vital contribution to the Canadian standard of living by the maintaining of international trade is the good right arm of Canada's prosperity.